So, um, okay, so, to, so what I want to do is to give a very uh, easy overview of uh, card generating functions. So I won't give any details or technicalities, uh, but I will give uh, enough results to, to be able to, to formulate some uh, interesting open questions. Um, so essentially, card generating function is the theory of developing automatic tools to, uh, to find cutting planes for mathematical programming problems. Uh, so it can be applied to mm, a, a large class <laughs> of uh, optimization problems, but uh, let's just keep in mind integer programming, so pure integer programming. Uh, so you have a linear objective, linear constraints, and integrality requirements on every variable. And uh, as you know, so you have uh, integer points inside the polyhedron, and what you want to do is to find uh, a cutting plane uh, that uh, is valid for the integer point in the polyhedron, but uh, uh, hopefully gives a better approximation of the convex star. And uh, you, we, we all know a, an automatic way to develop, uh, to, to find uh, uh, a cutting plane for a pure integer programming problem once we have solved the uh, LP relaxation, which is the Gomery mixed integer cuts. So Gomery uh, mixed integer cuts, as the name say, says, uh, can be applied to uh, mixed integer programming problems, but here, here I'm recalling them for uh, pure integer programming problems. So after you solve the uh, linear relaxation, you have the optimal tableau. This is a single row of the tableau, where yi is, uh, is the basic variables variable appear in this tableau row, and these xj's are the uh, non-basic variables, and so you have that uh, uh, constraint like this, where the right-hand side is, of course, not integral, otherwise you don't, uh, you cannot derive any, any cut from this row. And what uh, GMI cuts do is uh, finding some uh, explicit formula, this is for the pure integer case, uh, so now it's not really important how the coefficients uh, uh, come uh, up, but essentially what you do is uh, you, you partition the variables into two groups depending on this fj is the fractional part of the coefficient aj. So fj is the fractional part, uh, so this laser pointer is not really working. fj is the fractional part of aj and fi is the fractional part of bi. So these f's are the fractional parts. So depending on the fractional parts you partition the variables into two groups and uh, if you know aj and bi you know what coefficients you have to write to derive uh, uh, this cut. So yeah, what you can do if you, mm, let's assume that this right-hand side bi is fixed, then every coefficient here only depends on uh, aj. So once you know aj, this number is just a function of uh, uh, aj if fi is fixed, if bi is fixed. And this number is also just a function of uh, aj. Uh, so once bi is fixed, I have to fix it to, uh, to put this into the framework of, of, framework of cut generating function. So essentially, you know the coefficient that you have to uh, write beside every variable xj by just looking at the, the coefficient that appears in the tableau row. So we have some function where this pi aj, aj is simply this number if this condition holds, or this number if this condition holds. Okay, so this pi is just a real function from the reals to the reals, uh, which takes value fractional part of the argument divided by fractional part of the bi in one case and this other value in the second. Sorry? Uh, Fi is the fractional part of the right hand side. Yeah. Yeah, I'm calling it i just because it's a single row of the tableau. Let's say it's row i. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so again, if bi is fixed, uh, you have this function. This is a cut generating function. It means that uh, uh, you have a fixed function. And you can apply it to every single coefficient of the non-basic variables. And just knowing this aj, the coefficient, you know what you have to uh, write uh, in, in the cut. So this is a cut generating function. Uh, let me also mention, because I will uh, recall this uh, later, that uh, GMI cuts uh, use the fact that yi is integral, use the fact that uh, the non-basic variables are non-negative and integral. But here you don't use the fact that uh, yi is non-negative when you derive this cut. Let's just keep this in mind. Okay, so this, uh, so this is a special cut generating function. You can draw the, the plot of this function. If you do it, you, you find this uh, function. It is, of course, periodic, modulo one, because you only play with the fractional parts. And you can check that this is exactly the, the shape of this function. Okay. So now, what is, in general, a cut generating function? So I, I will now give the... Uh, 
more general abstract definition, and then I will show you how GMI cuts are a special case of that definition, because maybe it's not immediately clear. So we, we are in some d-dimensional space, in d-dimensional space Rd, and we fix some closed set S, which doesn't contain the origin. And now, uh, so this d is fixed. Now, for any possible value n, you look at the d by n matrix. So the number of rows of R is fixed, is d, but you can take any number of columns. And for every such, oops, for every such matrix R, you construct this uh, feasible region, which looks strange now, but looks strange now. But this is the, the region you construct. It's the set of non-negative integer vectors such that Rx falls uh, inside the set S. Okay, so let's take this uh, set. And now what you want to do is to find uh, an inequality which separates the origin from this uh, set, uh, from the closed convex hull of this set. You, you can prove that the origin doesn't belong to this set, uh, to the closed convex hull of this set. This can be proven. So there must be a linear inequality which separates the origin from that set. <coughs> and you want to find such an inequality, as I said, in some uh, automatic way. So we call uh, cut generating function, but I will uh, say later always valid function. So we call a valid function, a cut generating function, any function which uh, take, uh, takes as input the d-dimensional vectors. So th these will be the columns of R. This will be the input of our function. And uh, output uh, a non-negative number, which will be the coefficients of the cut. So what you want, that what you, what you, what you want, what you want is that uh, whatever matrix R you choose, uh, so any number of columns and any choice of the columns. If you write uh, this set, uh, which depends on the matrix R, and you apply the function pi to every single column of R, you want then, uh, and then you write this cut, th this inequality. So you, you, use, uh, you apply pi to the column Rj, you receive a number as output, and you use the number as coefficient here. Then you want that this function is valid, this inequality, this inequality is valid for this set. So again, if for every choice of R, this inequality that you obtain by applying pi to every column of R is valid for your set, then that's a cup generating function. That's a valid function. It's like in a GMI cut. So I have a procedure, I have a formula which just looks at the columns that in that case were just single numbers because I had a single row. And the formula is a function that gives me the coefficient to write here. This, of course, cuts off the origin. Okay, the origin doesn't have the same. So, uh, if you have never seen this, I don't, uh, I'm not sure you, this is completely clear. But l let me show why GMI cuts, which I think are, are clear, are a special case of this uh, setting. Uh, so le let's go back to an IP problem. You solve it, uh, and you have uh, uh, the optimal tableau for the linear relaxation. Let's call y the vector of basic variables, x the vector of non-basic variables, and recall that they are non-negative variables in the in this linear relaxation. They are also integer in the IP problems, but they are still not negative in the linear relaxation. So a tableau looks like this. You have a, the vector of basic, var basic variables plus a combination of the non-basic variable is equal to some right-hand side. This is a tableau. If the right-hand side is integer, then you have found the optimal solution, so the integer solution. So we assume that it's not integer. Now, if you use the fact that y is an integral vector, you can write this system in this form. So Rx must be equal to b plus some integer vector. Actually, Rx is equal to b minus y. y is an integer vector, so this is what you get. So here I am forgetting the fact that y is not negative. Okay. Now, if you write the set that we defined before, this, this is the set we, we, we want to use in generating function, you see that we are exactly in this form if s is b plus the integer lattice, okay? So this uh, strange set, uh, if you take S to be a translation of the integer lattice, is just the, uh, a rewriting of the uh, linear relaxation given by the optimal tableau when you forget about the non-negativity of the basic variable, okay? And GMI cuts, okay, you can apply, you can define a cut generating function here. It will take, uh, it will, it will take values, uh, uh, it will take, uh, d-dimensional vectors as arguments, but if you only look at a single row of the tableau, then you have really a function from R to R, like the GMI cut I showed before. Uh, in that case, S will be just uh, 
B plus uh, B. Okay, so in, in the rest of the talk, I will uh, only focus on the case in which S has this form or even this form. So when S has this form, it, which it means that I'm looking at uh, IP problems after solving the linear relaxation. If I look at this form, it means that I'm trying to de derive in cuts only looking at a single row of the tableau, like in GMI cuts. Actually, you might be more sophisticated, and if you want to use the fact that Y is non-negative, uh, then it's easy. I mean, the algebra is very uh, easy. You, you just write, the, the math is very easy. You just write that S is, uh, so we are here. If Y is non-negative, then Rx must be equal to B minus a non-negative integer vector. So this is the set S that you want to define in that case, B minus uh, non-negative integer vector. But this is much more complicated. There are very recent results by Gerard Conajol and one of his students about this, but it's uh, something that I will not mention because it gets uh, much more complicated. Okay. And uh, now, uh, when you have uh, valid functions, card generating functions, uh, um, it might happen that you have two valid functions and one is dominated, uh, I mean, one is less than or equal uh, uh, than the other. Then in this case, uh, the smaller one always produces uh, stronger inequality because remember that uh, these values, pi prime of r, are the coefficients of the cut and we have no negative variables in our uh, setting. So you want a smaller coefficient. So you are only interested actually in minimal valid functions. Uh, minimal means that uh, uh, this no, doesn't happen. So it means that uh, there is no other valid function which is uh, smaller than our function. Okay, so this is a minimal valid function. Uh, now, one question is, uh, can, can, we, can one characterize minimal valid function, at least for the case of uh, uh, S equal B plus uh, the integer lattice? Uh, so this is uh, already known, thanks to Gomery and Johnson. So if S is this guy, so this means uh, I'm looking at the tableau of the linear relaxation. Then a function, a non-negative function, is a minimal valid function if and only if uh, three conditions hold. Uh, so let me point out that these conditions ensure that the pi is a valid function and that it is minimal. So it's, it's already included here that it's, also, it's valid and it is minimal. So one condition is that uh, this function takes value zero on the integer lattice. Second condition is called subadditivity, which means that the pi of the sum is less than or equal to uh, the sum of the pi's. And then there is a sort of symmetry condition that I will now show, but essentially means that if you compute pi in a, num, in a vector and in its complement with respect to b, this b here, you, you have to get always a one. And uh, one can see that uh, these conditions implies that pi is a periodic modulo z d, d, which means that the pi of r and pi of r plus an integer vector are the same thing. And they also imply that pi is uh, bounded between 0 and 1. Okay. So for instance, let's look at uh, GMI cuts. So in this case, d is equal to 1 because we only look at a single row of the tableau. S is uh, this thing here, as we already uh, saw. And I can assume that b is between 0 and 1 because uh, b plus z, uh, I can assume that b is between 0 and 1. So this is uh, our function. So the first condition is clearly satisfied. Pi of the integer is 0. So additivity, maybe it's not really clear if you don't uh, usually work with that, but it's easy to see that this function is also subadditive. And the symmetry condition essentially means that, uh, uh, so once you know that pi of 0 and pi of 1 is equal to 0, symmetry condition, first of all, implies that p, pi of b must be equal to 1, and this is true. And, and then that means that in the interval 0, b, the plot must be symmetric with respect to, to the center of that interval. And in the interval b1, the plot must be symmetric with respect to the center of the interval. Okay, so this is the symmetry condition that must be satisfied. So minimal, uh, so GMI cuts are minimal valid functions because of the characterization of uh, um, Comoré and Johnson. Okay, but minimal is not enough. It's, it's like uh, when you have a polyhedron, uh, so you can, I mean, it's not really the same thing, but you can think of minimal inequalities like uh, corresponding to, uh, so a minimal in a valid inequality, well, you know what, what it is for a polyhedron. Minimal means that it touches the polyhedron, but it's not enough, you want facets usually. So what we want to find is uh, extreme functions. So 
A valid function uh, is extreme if you cannot write it as a convex combination of two, others, uh, of two other um, valid functions. And the uh, question now is, uh, can we characterize the extreme function even for the very special case S equal D plus uh, ZD or even for a single row? Uh, no, so this is uh, not known. There are some uh, nice uh, sufficient conditions that ensure extremality. So the most famous one, probably again due to Gomery and Johnson, again from 72, which says the following. So let's look at the single uh, row, so only a single row of the tableau, then uh, and assume that pi is uh, continuous and piecewise linear. So it's a valid function, it is continuous, and it is piecewise linear. Under these assumptions, if you know that uh, there are only two values uh, for the derivative for the slope of pi, then the function is extreme. So for instance, uh, GMI cuts, as you remember, it's just uh, going up with one slope and then coming down with another slope, and then you repeat. So you only have two slopes. So that function is uh, valid, uh, is continuous, it's piecewise linear, it takes two slopes, so it is extreme. So GMI cuts are really good uh, uh, from this point of view. And there is a generalization of this uh, which works for uh, uh, multi-row tableau. So in the Gomery and Johnson theorem, you don't require the function to be minimal. I, I don't need to require it to be minimal. No, no, no. I checked that this morning because I have the same uh, doubt. Uh, no, you, you don't need it. You need it to be valid, but not minimal. Okay, there is the generalization to D rows, which is very recent, which says that, again, if you assume that it's non-negative, continuous, piecewise linear, valid function, so it, as before, now the slope is the gradient of the function in the fitted, where, where it makes sense to compute it. If this gradient takes at most D plus one values, then it's extreme, and I'm omitting a very technical condition that you don't want to know. Uh, so it's uh, really the generalization of this uh, result, the one is equal to one. Okay, so mm, okay, so these are sufficient conditions. They are not necessary. Uh, actually, uh, maybe it's too much to ask to uh, characterize uh, extreme, extreme functions, so to find the necessary and sufficient conditions. But at least, uh, can we give uh, nice uh, sufficient conditions? Uh, sorry, necessary conditions, uh, like saying every extreme function uh, must satisfy this very nice condition, apart from those that we already know from minimality, uh, like periodicity, symmetry conditions, etc. Et uh, so, for instance, there was this question, very vague question by Gomery and Johnson, actually a conjecture by Gomery and Johnson, that extreme functions uh, are really nice. So, for instance, is it true that uh, all extreme functions uh, are continuous? Uh, actually, this is not true. So, there are many examples now, but the first one was found by uh, Latchford and Lodi, and essentially they give uh, a valid function and they prove that it's extreme. Uh, for, for a single row, I'm talking now of a single row, and uh, the functions, the function look more or less uh, uh, like this, something like, uh, not sure it's correct, but uh, something like this, uh, more or less. So you have uh, th uh, really jumps uh, at the breakpoints. Okay, so there are extreme functions that are not uh, continuous, uh, but still this is piecewise linear, I mean it's uh, linear between any two consecutive breakpoints, so maybe is it true that extreme valid functions uh, are always piecewise linear? No, this is false. So there is uh, this construction by Mitad, Michele, Gerard, and Giacomo. Uh, they essentially take uh, uh, a sequence uh, of valid functions, uh, extreme valid functions. Uh, in this sequence, every function has uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, breakpoints, and they take the limit of this sequence. Uh, and they can prove that the limit is still extreme, but this limit is not piecewise linear anymore. So it's a thing, something that I cannot depict, but it's really a, a mess. I mean, it's not a, a linear, a piecewise linear function. Okay, so maybe we can, we can do this. Okay, so let, let's assume that the function is extreme, continuous, and piecewise linear. So, I mean, it's not true that they are always like that, but let's assume they are like, that some a function is like that. Since we have sufficient conditions that, uh, are related uh, that we, to, to the number of slopes, uh, can we give also necessary conditions related to the number of slopes? So is it true that uh, 
extreme functions have uh, few slopes, maybe not two, as in the result of uh, Gomer and Johnson, but few slopes uh, for, for the one dimensional again case. So there is a little bit of history here. So as, you, as, as we saw, if there are only two slopes, yeah, then the function is extreme, but this is not a necessary condition. So there is, uh, I mean, Gomery and Johnson themselves found a construction to obtain a, a, an extreme function, which is continuous piecewise linear and has three slopes. And let me show this construction because I will uh, use it later. Uh, so they start from GMI, so from this. So let me do it better. They start from GMI cut. Of course, then this is periodic. I only, only draw in one interval. And then they choose uh, uh, an arbitrary slope here. And then they come down with the same slope that uh, they have here. So this line is parallel to this. So this is replaced with this. And then uh, by symmetry, they have to do the same thing here. So So this function now has three slopes, which is uh, the original slope here, the original slope here, which is repeated here and here, and then this uh, additional slope here. So it's three slopes. And you can choose uh, any slope here, and this will be extreme. And they prove that this function is extreme. So there is a very easy construction to get a three slope function, which uh, is a modification of GMI function. Uh, this was in 2003, and it took uh, eight years to find the four slope function. But the funny thing is that uh, this function is essentially obtained starting from this and do the, doing the same thing on this uh, part of the graph. I mean, you have to be careful when choosing the slopes. Now it's not that you can choose any slope, but uh, it's just a similar modification uh, here. So it, it's funny that it took eight years to, to find this, uh, to have this idea. Or maybe nobody was thinking about this. I don't know. Uh, okay, so for slope, remember we want to know whether there is a, a bound on the number of slopes. So very recently, a 28 slope function was found. So actually this is 2014, but the paper is uh, formally published in 2015. But the result is of last year. Uh, this was found uh, by a computer search. N not really a random computer search. It's really a clever computer search. So they had to do something, uh, uh, not just running the code. Uh, it, it's a very, uh, it cannot be described in a nice way. It's really a, a function with uh, breakpoints, uh, many, many breakpoints, hundreds of breakpoints. So it's really a, not a nice function. But still, uh, if you are looking for an upper bound, an upper bound, and you know that uh, 27 doesn't hold as an upper bound, then maybe you don't think there is an upper bound anymore. And indeed, uh, this summer, uh, together with uh, Amitab, uh, Michele Conforti, uh, uh, Joe Pat, uh, we could uh, show that for every k you can construct a k-slope function. And again, the funny thing is that you just have to use this trick. So everything was hidden here. So you just have to now iterate this. So you do this here and here. And now it has four slopes. And then you keep repeating this as many times as you want. Again, you can choose whatever slope you want here. You don't have to. It's not very easy to prove that this is, uh, I mean, it's not difficult to prove that it's a minimal function that needs to be constructed, but it <laughs> takes some effort to prove that it's extreme, but you can do that. So and it's just like original uh, construction is a, of three slopes? Or yeah, it's an iteration of the construction of Gomery and Johnson for three slopes, yes, exactly. And it's a reduction function. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's just one independent idea, although so that's the only proof that it's yeah, I mean, th this is the construction. Mm -hmm. The proof doesn't follow the proof of uh, Gomery and Johnson because the, their, their, their proof was really special for three slopes. So the proof of extremality is not just induction. I mean, it uses some induction, but it's really involved. The construction is just, uh, yeah, the construction is very easy. It's, it's this one. Yeah. And actually, what is uh, worse is that if you take the pointwise limit of this sequence of function, so in general, when you do this, you don't get an extreme function again. But in this case, you can prove that you get an extreme function. So this means that you have extreme function with infinitely many slopes, which means that uh, for, I mean, if you take the limit for every neighborhood of the origin and of B, where the slopes are uh, accumulating. Uh, yeah, I mean, outside of these neighborhoods, you have uh, uh, arbitrarily many uh, slopes. So in this sense, you have infinitely many slopes. 
Okay, so there is no bound uh, for the number of slopes. So there is no bound for the number of breakpoints, even if you assume that the number of slopes is two. So it's really, it's really a mess. So the question you ask now is, uh, uh, what the hell in this function can be really anything? There doesn't seem to be any any nice structure, any nice structure apart from uh, uh, periodicity and symmetry conditions and subadditivity. There doesn't seem to be any anything uh, more than that. Um, then remember that this, the motivation for this uh, nice mathematical theory is uh, obtaining cutting planes for practical problems. So uh, if you have a cogenerating function with uh, 1,000 slopes, I don't think that you would like to use it in a, uh, to derive uh, an inequality from a single row with a blow. I mean, it's, uh, doesn't, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not claiming that they are not useful because I didn't try, but I don't want to try. It's, uh, and uh, so the question, the very vague question, is how to define uh, a model. So maybe this model is to, as Michele keeps uh, repeating, this model com I mean, comprises too many uh, things. So it, uh, and so it has to generate uh, extreme functions that are really uh, weird. So maybe we need a model that uh, uh, still reasonable, but that uh, produces only nice functions. Uh, so one attempt in this direction, this is already known by Comrie and Johnson's. Johnson, I'm not saying that it's the right model, but it's just to see another version of this model is what is called the, the finite model. So this is called the infinite uh, relaxation, the one that I discussed so far. Uh, there is the finite version, the discrete version of this uh, finite, the infinite model, which is the same thing. So you fix a set S, but now when you construct this uh, set, you only want to consider matrix R with whose entries are multiple of some uh, fixed one over K. Uh, the motivation for this is that uh, in practical problems you have rational da data. If the data is rational, then there is some k such that all the data is multiple of one over k. So why don't we only restrict to uh, input uh, with entries multiple of some fixed uh, one of one over k for some fixed k, and then you define a cogenerative function in the same way, but now the domain of the function is just the set of points in the, pla in the plane, in the space that have uh, entries multiple of one over k. Because then you want to apply pi to the columns of R, and the columns of R are like that. Okay? But the definition is, exact is exactly the same. Uh, now, now, of course, uh, the domain of the function is not, more, uh, is not anymore uh, a continuous set, it's a discrete set. Of, so, of course, uh, things like this cannot happen anymore. So we are, of course, uh, eliminating uh, weird things. So continuity and discontinuity is not the matter anymore because everything is uh, continuous because the set is the domain is discrete so everything is continuous by definition. And so um, maybe this uh, works better. So uh, there, there are uh, so minimality and extremality. So minimality uh, has the same characterization as for the infinite model. Actually Gomery and Johnson proved the m a more general result that in result that includes uh, includes the one that I mentioned for the infinite model and this one, which in fact look the same. So if you have, uh, again, S is uh, this one. Minimality is again the non-negativity, being equal to zero on the integer lattice, subadditivity and symmetry condition, exactly as before. But now the point is that, uh, so let's assume that, so the domain is, uh, uh, so this is the, the domain of my function. Uh, so since you know that the function must be periodic, modulo z2 in this case, so it means that you only have to characterize the function uh, here, in the 0, 1 square, but you only have a finite number of points uh, that are multiple 1 over k in this square. So in order to give me completely a function, you only have to specify a finite number, sorry, a finite number of values. In particular, this means that pi is minimal if and only if uh, it belongs to some polyhedron in a space with k to the d component. Polyhedron because these conditions are all linear. You have no negativity, which is hidden here. Equations, inequalities, and equations. So it's really a polyhedron. Okay, and remember the question of find, um, characterizing extreme functions was difficult for the infinite model. For the finite model, it seems to be easier because you only want to find the extreme points of this polyhedron. And you know it explicitly this polyhedron. So if you think of the case d equal to one, which is already very interesting and uh, open. This is really a set of uh, 
quadratic number of inequalities, uh, which you can write down explicitly. So can you find the extreme points of this uh, uh, polyhedron? And the, the answer is, uh, uh, the answer is I can't, but maybe uh, someone can. So I, I don't know how to do that. Um, there must be some nice combinatorial structure because we have uh, really uh, inequalities that, uh, I mean, they, they look nice. It's like I, I feel that you can maybe work with some graphs, graph or hypergraph or some combinatorial structure and characterize the extreme point of the polyhedron in terms of the, of the some uh, structure, some combinatorial structure. Anyway, um, yeah, so w what are the links between uh, the infinite and the finite model, at least uh, for the one dimensional case, which is again this one, so one row of the tableau. So the first guess, so first of all, what do the functions look like in the one dimensional case? So essentially, they are really something like this. Finite. 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 This is finite, and this is uh, dimension one. A function is just uh, like this, and you only have to define it from <laughs> zero up to one, and it's uh, periodic. Okay. So the first guess, first thing you one want to know is, wants to know is what happens if I take the linear interpolation of these functions. So assume this, is, assume this function, this discrete function is extreme, extreme for the finite model. What happens if I take the linear interpolation? Is, is it gonna be extreme for the infinite model? The answer is uh, no. My, you, you, you always obtain a valid function if you do this, but it's not guaranteed to be extreme for, uh, is it valid? I'm not sure actually now. Uh, so. But it's not extreme for the infinite model. And this, there is an example by, Richard and A, in which uh, the number of, uh, in which k, so the number of uh, points, uh, the interval 0, 1 is 7. Actually, I don't know why they didn't realize that there is a smaller example with k equal to 5. So you, already with k equal to 5, you have an example in which this uh, fails. But the converse is true. So if you start from a piecewise, cont a continuous piecewise linear body function for the infinite model, something like this, and then you restrict to a grid uh, that contains all the breakpoints, okay, then that's gonna be extreme for the finite model. So in this direction, uh, the implication works. So you can go from the infinite uh, model to the finite model and preserve uh, extremality if you restrict to a grid that contains all the breakpoints, assuming your function is nice, continuous and piecewise linear. There is also a very, very, very recent result uh, which says that uh, Again, if you know that uh, your function is continuous and piecewise linear, uh, but you have to know in advance uh, that it's also valid, then uh, extremality for the infinite model is equivalent to being extreme for some finite model, but this finite model is not the one which contains the breakpoints. I mean, it's not the smaller grid that contains the breakpoint, but you have to refine the grid uh, three times. And in this, um, okay, but this still doesn't answer one question, which Michele likes very much, which is the following. So, okay, if you take a discrete, uh, if you take a discrete function, which is an extreme function for the finite model, if you interpolate, it's not extreme for the infinite model. But can you maybe not interpolate, but create a more complicated function which uh, is an extension of our function? So maybe adding more breakpoints. Can you, can you prove that uh, if uh, a function is extreme for the finite model, then you can extend it to a continuous piecewise linear function whose restriction is exactly the one you started from? And you want this extension to be extreme. So Michele conjectured this. Uh, that summer in Baltimore, and unlike many of, the, of his conjectures, this uh, survived the, the first 10 minutes. So <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. Seriously, this, this seems to be really true, but uh, we have no idea. No, the point is that we don't have any idea of what kind of tools uh, one might use to prove this. It really is, seems really difficult. I think that Amitabh claims that uh, if you don't want to ask uh, 
yeah. uh, that the function is continuous and piecewise linear but just extreme, then uh, it's true. I, he, he uses some uh, uh, analysis tool that I don't really get completely, but uh, he says that then it's easy to see. Uh, but if you want to enforce the condition that your extension is nice, then it uh, seems, it seems uh, much more difficult. Uh, second question, I already asked this question, is uh, how can you, character, can you characterize the extreme function for the finite model? Which means, uh, can you characterize, or, or at least finding, find, sorry, uh, good uh, necessary condition for uh, a function to be extreme for the finite model? which means that can you find conditions for a point to be a vertex of a given polyhedron, which is explicitly given. We characterize for class, uh, Yeah. And what is nothing? I think nothing. I mean, I don't know anything about that. About this, the vertices of, I mean, uh, apart from the fact that, okay, GMI cuts, uh, also the discrete version of GMI cuts are extreme, so you have some specific uh, extreme points that you know. We played with some software to understand uh, at least the structure of some subclasses of the vertices, but it's, I mean. So it should be combinatorial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
That's a nice point. I, it sounds very challenging. I don't know. <laughs> And this GMI cut is an extreme function, so when you modify it, you have to, since it's extreme, if you try to gain something in some sense, you have to lose something, and, and <coughs> it's like uh, you have to compensate. Uh, yeah, I don't know, just thinking aloud. 